Hello, good morning. Waiting for a few more minutes and starting. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, hello, good morning once again. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Welcome into our yet another, don't know which number is lecture on data mining. So yesterday we discussed further some details of the order book then came to the idea of the normalized order book spectrum explained why normalization is good and why we should do it and why do you remember why to use it in uh, machine learning problems we would definitely need to normalize any data otherwise indeed. it would not be viable indeed you can learn whatever patterns could be learned only on repetitive data data which are not normalized are not repeated and therefore not in any sense and in that case nothing can be learned of them that's true and then we touched upon one abnormality uh, abnormality detection which would be abnormally large orders placed somewhere in the depth of the order book for example not at the best part at the best task or best bid but placed somewhere at level two three five not very deep but not at the best price either and we realize that it is an unethical practice of market manipulation which is completely illegal in the united states not illegal in Russia 
And that's why, unfortunately, many people do it, especially in the futures market and possibly in the spot market as well. One thing which might be interesting using the data which you got uh, trying to detect such abnormalities. So first of all, uh, what we should probably do is to visualize the spectrum. So once uh, the order book spectrum is constructed up to a certain depth in your lab sessions, uh, how deep uh, is the spectrum you are constructing? Five price levels, 10 price levels? 10 price um, levels for each side. Sorry, I couldn't hear. Could you please repeat that? I couldn't hear you. Like 50 price steps from uh, each limit price and divided by 10 sub ranges. 10 sub ranges. Okay. So 50, yes. So for the overall size, we use 50 price steps and compute the total size over those 50 price steps. Yes, absolutely. And then what? Uh, you divide those 50 into groups uh, of uh, five. So for example, one to five, six to 10 and so on. What do you do um, with those 50? Oh, well, just basically we create a, like histogram, but we save them to the file for each change in the order book. Okay, uh, so how does this histogram look like? Is it for all 50 levels? Uh, like, as I understood, the histogram is something for each particular timestamp. Like, it's yes. not something... Yes. You, are absolutely one. Right. you are absolutely right with that, that the histogram is produced for each particular order book snapshot. So at any time when the order book changes, you recreate the histogram. Of course, the histogram is not constant. Absolutely. So you're absolutely right with that. <coughs> how do you construct the histogram? Uh, so how many uh, columns would it have? 20 columns. Sorry, how many? 20. 20, so you do 10 on each side, all right, okay. Yes, well. and like there are basically a uh, sum of volumes for each price divided by total volume. Okay, so total volume is computed over 50, all right? The total volume is computed yeah. over 50 yes. price steps, all right? And then uh, you uh, compute volume partial volume for 10 price steps on each side, all right? So what does it mean? So just, uh, you know, at the best price, then one price step away, one more price step away. So basically from one to 10, all right? No, we have uh, from price limit, we have 50 price steps. Okay. So 10 sub ranges and five price step and five ah, price okay. steps so in each sub range. Uh, you do it that way. It is also a very good way uh, of doing that, yes. That's, that's quite a good way of doing that. Uh, you could do either this or you could uh, do it slightly differently. Select 10 price steps, but not, uh, not sub ranges, but just 10 price steps from one to 10 and still divide by cumulative 50. In this case, obviously it doesn't normalize to one. Uh, but uh, doing like you do it, I think it is even a better way of normalizing the stuff. So I fully agree with this approach. Very good. Okay. So then you get spectrum. Uh, now, have you already got them? So how many per trading day, how many different spectra do you obtain that way? So uh, we built it 
for on the first day for each instrument as a task. Yes. Suppose that it is, for example, USD rubble tomorrow. So on average, how many spectra do you get per day? I would believe uh, how many trading days and uh, trading seconds do we have per day? It is from uh, for USD rubble tomorrow. Uh, it is about 50,000 trading seconds. Uh, if you calculate the number of trading seconds from 10 a.m. to 23.50, I think it is about 49,000 something, right? Uh, so it is 13 hours, 50 minutes, right? Uh, I didn't understand your question, actually. Okay. Like, are uh, you asking no. about how many entries we have in, in the file? Uh, yes, basically how many snapshots, uh, spectra snapshots uh, you uh, get. I think it should be about a million or possibly more than a million. How many? Yes, yes. It, like for me, it's 1 million 84,000 and like. That's very reasonable. Uh, that's very reasonable. Mm -hmm. What I say, uh, the trading session from 10 a.m. in Moscow Exchange. Uh, by the way, uh, did I share the whiteboard or I did not? No. Okay. You can see it now. Mm. Considering USD ruble tomorrow, it is traded from 10 a.m. to 23.50. This makes 49,800 trading seconds. Interestingly enough. In prime time, just maybe from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., To 15. Um, you could expect probably, I don't know, maybe up to 100 updates per second. Sometimes, but not uniformly. Uh, after 3 p.m., much less, and after 6 p.m., much, 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 much less. So, all together, obviously, updates are not uniform in time, you say it is one plus million updates, right? Or snapshots. Yeah. Which result in different spectra, right? Very good. Um, now, let us do some statistics on the snapshots we have obtained. Uh, a good thing it is normalized, yes. What you could do, uh, first of all, obviously all these snapshots are somehow different, but the question is, uh, all the book spectra we obtain, can they be viewed as Uh, unified over time, I mean, sorry, as uh, stationary over time, or they're essentially uh, non-stationary. What are your ideas, actually? So if I ask, uh, they are all different, obviously, they are functions of time. Nevertheless, if, uh, for example, they are all sufficiently close to each other, obviously there are some deviations. If someone, for example, had played this illegal very large order for the purpose of manipulating the markets, then uh, for a very moment, 
the other book spectrum spectrum would be very 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 much different from an average one but uh, in general we can ask a very interesting question within a trading day can we assume that uh, the order book is uh, more or less stationary uh, over time what do you think let's um, let's uh, probably think about this together so if uh, this is a very important question actually because uh, if the answer is yes then uh, if we develop a trading strategy which somehow deals with uh, this order book then it can be more or less unchanged over the trading day if we see significant differences uh, in uh, the order book spectrum then we may uh, need to adjust or to devise different uh, maybe strategies uh, in different periods per day so we would have some kind of intraday seasonality so how can we check whether the order book uh, has statistically similar stationary structure over the time or it is not what do you think how can we do it maybe we can apply some statistical tests uh, on the distribution for yes yes for we can indeed apply statistical tests on the distribution so basically we would ask the question of uh, whether the distributions are the same or not there will be null hypothesis uh, saying that they are indeed the same or if we would see whatever actually criterion we apply uh, it provides a significant deviation between the two uh, then uh, uh, then we would reject the null hypothesis and say that no uh, they are not the same so what would be our first step uh, in order to verify this what do you think okay we got our order book spectrum uh, the order book spectrum is actually uh, a set of two probability density functions because both bid side and ask side are normalized to one all right right yes okay so basically we have two probability density functions and because there are two of them uh, the statistical criteria for similarity of those densities uh, would be applied different uh, separately for bid side and for the ask side okay now what should we what should be uh, should we probably do in the first step we got our order book for each update time t it is just impractical and i think it is well computationally infeasible and in general a very poor idea if we just take arbitrary pairs t1 t2 and compare the distributions uh, between t1 and t2 Maybe what can we do better it's a good idea to cut uh, some earlier records and uh, the records uh, in the evening when uh, market is closing maybe maybe uh, i propose that initially we'll do uh, what you suggest actually it is a good idea we'll do intraday seasonality but uh, initially let's probably do the following using all these order book spectra are computed for all t let us to begin with maybe let us construct 
some kind of average spectrum, average over time. Can we do that? It is a very, very simplistic initial approach just to average the spectrum over time within a day. You mean basically all 20 values, just take average of them by the column? Generally, yes. But isn't it uh, let useless? Us see, let us see. Um, again, there are two ways of doing that. I think. So again, this is our price. For any particular T, we have, it doesn't really matter well the zero, where the zero point is. We discussed yesterday, you remember that. Uh, I played zero in the midpoint, you played zero where? At the best uh, bid or best ask, where was your zero? At the best bid, bid perhaps, right? In your spectrum construction, where was the zero? Technically, we have two zeros, so the best bid and best ask. Ah, oh, even so. Okay, okay. And you know, that's probably a good idea as well. Let's do exactly that. So we have two zeros. Because then your order book is, uh, your order book spectrum is a relative to the best price. That's probably uh, just you know uh, a valid way. Maybe for some other purposes uh, we could play zero at the midpoint, but it doesn't really matter uh, at the moment. So let's examine your solution with two zeros. Okay, because we'll do this separately for bits and tasks anyway. Okay, so then we have uh, let's say zero one, two, and so on. So if you have, uh, as you say, uh, 10 bands, each band comprised of five price levels, uh, therefore let's number them from uh, zero to nine, and then you have, for each band, you have a certain normalized value from zero to one okay uh could i quickly ask a question yes, why you have two zeros i just don't get it because for example in the lab task there is no about two zeros and i did like this one and i guess everyone else should do it this one because there is no statement in the lab um you see both ways are correct. So I can produce arguments, both actually for having two zeros and for having one zero. But what is the main difference between two approaches? Uh, you see, if you have two zeros, then both actually asks and bids are considered completely separate because each one has its own zero, all right? So we have a Chinese wall between bits and tasks, and each of them has its own distribution. So that's basically some kind of probability so density function, right? Or better visualization? Uh, no, slightly different. Let me let, let, let me finish that. Okay. And because uh, both of them are normalized to one, so we have a probability density function here, PDF A, and we have PDF B probability density function for bits, right? Uh, we are going to analyze both of them using those uh, statistical similarity uh, criteria. And because both of them are valid probability density function, they are normalized to one. So it is entirely valid approach. So basically you just analyze two PDFs. That's okay. One thing which you miss in this case when you have two zeros, because there are two zeros, then you do not have, you lose information about the bid ask spread, right? Bid ask spread is not measured in that case because each price starts from its own zero. 
in this case, in analyzing the order book spectra, there is simply no uh, Bedesk spread. But arguably, this is a valid approach, and it is okay to analyze uh, order book spectra separately and then add a Bedesk spread as a separate factor for analysis, which uh, we can examine later on its own. So we might not even uh, mix uh, this uh, Bedesk spread into the spectrum. On the other hand, if you do, if you have only one zero, and in that case, it is probably better to place uh, the zero in the midpoint, then I would suggest a slightly different approach. So in this case, you would calculate the total, uh, you would consider both bits and tasks as a single probability density function. So by your total, if you have uh, one zero, so okay, uh, let's, let's put the writing. Two zeros means two separate PDFs. Uh, BDESK spread, not analyzed. One zero mean the following. Uh, first of all, place it better, not necessarily, but better, place it in midpoint. That's one thing. Secondly, by total quantity, which you use for normalization, by total quantity, you would better compute the sum of bits quantity and asks quantity. Total quantity would be uh, total 50 at bit side plus total 50 at ask side. Okay? Then uh, you construct one single PDF. Uh, so in that case, uh, so there would be, if you have two zero, then basically you have positive, uh, or how do you do uh, your price scale for bits if you have two zero? So do you consider prices to be negative or positive for bits? when you have two zeros. That's your bid side, that's your best bid, which is zero. So do you consider these prices to be negative? How did you implement it? With Actually, zero? for me, it's not clear why we should. <laughs> Sorry, it is not? It's not clear why we should consider them as negative ones. Um, I would say probably not. What you should do is just to number the intervals. You number the intervals from zero to nine, if two zeros, then uh, you do it into the depth of the book. So for asks, you do it in the increasing price direction. And for bids, you do it in the decreasing price direction, but still, you number your intervals from zero to nine, okay? And then your distribution is simply a function of the interval number. So let's say this is I, this is I, and then uh, your uh, histogram is uh, just normalized quantity as a function of I, where I is from one to nine, from zero to nine, okay? Only for asks, increasing I corresponds to increasing prices. For bids, increasing I corresponds to decreasing price, but it doesn't matter because you are not dealing with prices anymore. You are dealing with intervals, which we simply number through from zero to nine. So in this case, uh, your interval zero 
will always correspond to closest to top of the book, All right? Top of the book is here, that's top of the book. And nine, uh, the, sorry, nine is the most distant in the rear. in the rear of the book. That's what I suggest you do if you do it with two zeros, okay? Then two intervals and numbers are going from the top of the book into, into the depth, okay? Now, if you do it with one zero, It could be slightly different. As I say, it could be one single PDF. In that case, uh, you would probably number your intervals differently. So let's uh, let me present you with a drawing what how you could do it one with one zero. Um, although the question is whether you should or not. Uh, if you do it with one zero, yes, you get one single PDF. You normalize the sum of, uh, you normalize all quantities by the sum of total 50 bits and total 50 asks. Um, yes, and in that case, uh, if you do it that way, then you implicitly incorporate the BDASK spread in the account. BDASK spread is incorporated. Computationally, having one zero is more complex. Uh, then with two zeros. And whether it is a good idea or not, uh, there are both pros and cons. Uh, you do incorporate a BDASK spirit in that case, but computations are more difficult. And you know what? Um, I'm not completely sure whether you gain much extra information that way, or you simply just confuse and mix up the features. So for the moment, from having those considerations, you see pros and cons. I would suggest uh, to continue your approach with two zeros for the moment. And we'll add uh, the information on BDASK spread separately. I think dividing and conquering the features by considering them separately is a more fruitful and successful approach than uh, mixing them up in a single picture. Uh, to some extent, having one zero and therefore incorporating implicitly the BDASK spread because zero would be at the midpoint in that case into the picture is, uh, how would I say, uh, is similar to incomplete normalization. So I suggest, and especially because you have already started doing that, to continue your approach with two zeros, which is perfectly, perfectly okay. Now, that's what we got. Uh, this is a picture for one particular T, all right? That's for one particular T. Now, you compute the average. So let's do average bid, bid spectrum. The average ask spectrum. Uh, over all T for a day, for a given day. For all t already. 
how would you do it? Well, you probably know how to do it, all right? What's your idea? If I would like to average my spectra over the day, you got many, many, one million spectra for both sides, actually. Now we want to average them over a day. How do we do it? Maybe we can take an average for each interval. Yes, we will do it per interval. But then uh, the question is, how do we compute the averages? So yes, we get again those intervals from zero to nine. And for each interval, let's say interval i, we would get uh, the value. Well, in the very simple way, in the very simple way, suppose that there are n snapshots per day, all right? Where n is about 10 to power 6, as you said, all right? So for each column, uh, for each interval, what would be the simplest way to, to, to compute the average? Just to take the average, one over n, uh, sum of from i one to n, normalized quantity. No, i i is the number of intervals. Sorry, let me let me say j. I is the number of interval. Normalized quantity for this interval i. at time tj all right can i ask a question yes uh, about uh, like summing up like within one column uh shouldn't it be weighted or something because um like i don't know you are right during during the day we have different um, pace of like updating the market you are right uh well let's think about it that's why I presented the most simple formula. You, you, you remember I said it is the most straightforward and elementary way of doing that. It doesn't mean it is the best way. Yeah, but does it, it really how... give any information? Yes, yes, of course. You know, we are, we are just going into that, uh, obviously. Uh, so this is just uh, the very initial elementary approach to this. And you know, answering your question actually, that there are different paces of updating, I would say that this most straightforward approach is probably to some extent valid. Because you see, out of those n, a vast majority of updates would really fall into those five trading hours from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., right? when the updates are most frequent, uh, which means that, yes, uh, you would get cumulatively more weight in this averaging uh, falling into the hours where updates are frequent. Frequent updates means more TJ instance, right? So this simple averaging gives more weight to uh, high frequency trading hours. And the question is, is it a good idea? I would say yes, this is a good idea. Uh, outside of those prime hours, you would get less updates and therefore they would contribute significantly less into this average picture. Because I'm averaging over the whole period, all right? Now, um, there is another way of doing that. So that's way number one. Way number two of doing this 
You can probably tell me what is the way number two. We did something like this already in yesterday's lecture. So what do you think? What is another way of doing that? Is waiting by time. So rather than dividing by n, we would divide by t, where t is uh, the total trading time. Total trading time. Uh, which is Forty-nine thousand eight hundred seconds for 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 tomorrow instrument, of course. Then we do it that way. It is sum from again j equals to one to n. Again, normalized quantity for the column i as it happened at time tj multiplied by the time for how long this quantity holds and it holds so it appeared at tj and then it holds until the next tj plus one right so there would be tj plus one minus tj so effectively the length of this interval tj plus one minus tj divided by the total trading time would be the weight which we assign to the corresponding normalized quantity rather than the weight being simply uh, one over n and obviously the sum of all these intervals should be equal to the total trading time t uh, in this case can you tell me please so how this approach number two differs from approach number one. So we can specify the time interval for which we would like to count the average. But in the first case, we should specify the number of records we want to take. Um, so you see, yes, in the first case, n is the total number. You see, summation is going from one to n. So this is a simple arithmetic average, right? In um, the second case, let me rewrite it actually. In the second case, we can rewrite it as sum from j1 to n, same normalized quantity for column i, which appeared at time tj multiplied by the weight wj where wj is tj plus one minus tj all over t where t is the total trading time for the day for for, for this instrument so you see we basically assign uh, here uh, we assign a uniform weight of 1 over n for all normalized quantities. Here, we assign the weight wj to our normalized quantity, which is the fraction of time over which this uh, normalized quantity existed. This normalized quantity, it emerged at time tj, it corresponds to time tj, and then it holds and holds and holds and holds over time until it is replaced by the new normalized quantity at the next time tj plus one, all right? So we calculate the average over all of the records, n of the records, but- In both cases, in both cases, we indeed calculate the average over all and which is say 100 1 million records in both cases summation is going from one to one million uh the only difference between cases one and two 
is the weight which I assign to the records. In case number one, you have a uniform WJ equals to one over N. We have uniform weights. And in case number two, where the weight WJ is duration based, it's TJ plus one minus TJ over T, uh, then uh, the weight is proportional to how long this norm quantity existed. Oh, I see. It's like window function, yes? It is a like window function. I would say it is uh, an average over time. So number one, we can say it is average over count, average by count, and number two is average by time. You see, average, yes, average, average, average by count, and this one is average by time. Only in both cases, you need to verify, obviously, that your weights are normalized to one. So obviously, if WJ is one over N, then you trivially have that sum from J one to N, WJ is one, all right? For the weights which you compute here, you also need to check that sum from J one to N, WJ, is at least approximately equal to one. Uh, it would not be equal to one if you took a wrong value of T capital. T capital should be total trading time. So T capital is your uh, end of day minus start. In that case, yes, uh, you would have up to rounding errors you would have this sum of weights equal to one in both cases. So for the first case, averaging by count, we said that because high counts naturally belong to high frequency trading hours, then this average more represents high frequency trading hours, right? where the number of updates is large. Yes. Yes. Uh, what do you think about the case number two compared to number one? How would number two look like? You see, in number two, suppose that we are now in the evening hours. Updates to the order book are less frequent now. It but because they are less frequent, you have larger weights, right? Which means that uh, the method number two is more uniform. Uh, it provides a more uniform measure over the whole trading day. So number one uh, gives more weight to high frequency trading hours. You see, we pointed out that. And approach number two uh, is, uh, let's say, more evenly, I would say fairly, distributed over the whole trading day. Actually, I am not sure which approach is better. Uh, for example, giving more weight to less frequent trading hours in the evening. I don't know whether it is a good idea or not. May or may not be. But uh, you know what? We are data scientists here. 
we have absolutely well very little a priori knowledge about what our data would tell us our objective is to experimentally discover the properties of our data right no one neither you nor me would be able to tell in advance what kind of properties would we encounter and now we are facing a very i would say instructive point in uh, uh, in uh, our research so we see for example there are two methods of doing that we don't yet know exactly which one is better from whatever point of view whether they are going to yield different or maybe somewhat similar result uh, results maybe some one of them would yield very strange results and another one not we simply don't know when we have two possible methods of doing thing and we don't know a priori which one is better what do we do do both experiment do both <laughs> we do both and that's a very good way of doing the things do and then both. how will we know which one is better after we did both like what's the we'll, we'll, criteria we'll come to that point we'll come to okay. that point maybe uh both of them would be acceptable for whatever purpose let's see you know this resembles a very funny situation back in 1970s well long before you were born all right and i was in my childhood at that time so i only learned about this story much later when it was publicized uh the soviet government was trying to decide which model of a new intercontinental ballistic missile is to be put on service and there are two models developed by two different design officers and they demonstrated very 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 close characteristic they were very similar to each other only designed by two different officers and the government was so much deadlocked and not being able to decide which one was actually to be put into production and in service that they decided to do what put both put both of course if you are that look to do both uh there is a paradox uh, a very famous philosophical paradox which is called buridan s you probably think it is written like this donkey okay uh, a donkey which is placed in between two completely symmetric and equidistant equidistantly located heaps of hay cannot decide which one to eat and dies of indecision so in order not to die of indecision well of hunger due to indecision when we don't know what to do we do both okay now what should we do then uh suppose that one way or another we obtain the average then i suggest um let us actually uh we'll make just a very short break and then we consider what to do next okay just five minutes
Okay, we are back. Are you with us? Yes. Okay. Yes. So now we will compare the probability density functions we have computed. So uh, actually, if we did both ways for both bits and tasks, we got four different probability density functions, right? Bid ask uh, method one and method two. We got four different probability density functions. Initially, let's, uh, and it might be a good idea by itself. Let us compare separately for bits and tasks. Let us compare it that way. What method one would do and method two would do. Um, you probably remember or, or maybe not, if not, we'll uh, reconstruct this now. Uh, so how do we compare two probability density functions or two distributions? How do we decide whether they can be considered to be equal, uh, identical or not? Which, which statistical criteria do we have to that end? Parameters, for example, uh, average and uh, for oh. normal distribution, we take average and I forgot in English, but it's like uh, ah, deva de standard deviation. Okay, so yes, we can compute the average and standard deviation for both. But that's probably not enough. And so we, have, else, yes? we can uh, provide a statistical test. I say, remember, it's t test to compare to distribution. To compare the distribution with what? With normal distribution. With a normal distribution. But you see, in this case, the distributions may very well be non-normal. We are not interested as yet uh, in whether they are normal or not. Probably not, and it doesn't even matter in this case. We are interested in whether the two distributions can be considered to be equal or not. So that's a completely different story, right? And uh, if we compute and the momenta, uh, for example, the mean and standard deviation, this wouldn't help much either, because obviously they would be somehow different between the two distributions, but still we need to decide whether they are close enough or not close enough. So what I propose, there are several ways of how uh, two distributions can be compared for being identical. So comparing two distributions, let us present a method of doing that. Uh, one of the classical ways of doing that is the so-called kolmogorov smirnov criterion. Maybe you have seen it, maybe not, we'll restate it. Uh, the first thing is uh, the criterion works not on densities but on cumulative distribution functions on CDFs. Okay, so first of all, uh, suppose that we get a density, uh, well, two densities. So let me call them uh, PDF1, probability density function one, probability density function two. Uh, these two densities are basically represented as arrays indexed from 0 to 9, right? In our case, the arrays from 0 to 9. And in this array, there are some quantities. Uh, let me 
So for example, this is slot number K. This is slot number K. And then uh, there are quantities, I would say PK1 and PK2, okay? Okay. So these are densities. Out of these densities, we need to construct CDF. So cumulative distribution function one, cumulative distribution function two. Uh, how? Uh, it would be the formula C K one or two would be equal to sum from L equals to one to K cumulative distribution function, right? Uh, from one to K, P, K correspondingly, respectively one or two, uh, P, L, one or two. So the first element of CDF is just uh, the PDF. The second one is the sum of the first and second one, and then the running cumulative sum. Uh, if our P values are computed correctly, then uh, presumably C9 of one, two, uh, sorry, we number them from zero, not from one, sorry, uh, L from zero, my apologies, uh, from zero to K. And um, C912 should be approximately equal to one, all right? Because they are already normalized to one, the sum should be equal to one. Okay, we compute those CDFs. Now we construct basically the following uniform distance between uh, between the two. Uh, so the number of entries, uh, let me denote it by n, is 10, okay? Let's construct the distance, which is simply the maximum for k equals to zero to nine, uh, c one k minus c two k. So this is simply a uniform distance. Uniform distance between CDFs. So far it is it should be perfectly clear, right? Converted PDFs into CDFs and computed the uniform distance between CDFs. Okay. Now compute the following quantity, square root of n, n is 10 in this case, square root of n times d, and compare it with a certain quantity, which is called k alpha. Uh, I will explain in a second what it means. The k alpha is simply the statistical threshold. And Approximately, you can compute K alpha by uh, the following formula, that it is a square root of minus one half log of one minus alpha over two, where alpha is close to one. Uh, it is, uh, well, obviously in statistical test there is a confidence level and alpha is precisely the confidence level. Uh, could I ask a question? Uh, yes, of course, but we are not finished yet. Yes, please, yes. If anything is not clear, it, it will be clear in a second. Uh, what is your question? Oh, sorry, I'll wait. Yeah. Okay, so alpha is close to one, confidence level. Typically, uh, we would say alpha is zero point for example, 95 or uh, alpha is sometimes 0 0.995. Maybe we can begin with 0 0.95. Um, 
Sometimes we take alpha 0 0.9, but I wouldn't recommend that. Let's let, let's start with 0 0.95, for example. Uh, obviously, 1 minus alpha half is less than 1. The log is negative, and therefore the whole expression under the square root is positive, because we have minus here. And therefore, chi alpha is indeed computed. So the question is, whether this square root of n times d is greater than alpha, uh, k alpha. If greater, then we reject the hypothesis, reject the hypothesis H0, that the distributions are same. So in which case we conclude that the distributions are not the same. Are not the same. If, however, square root of D is less than or equal to k alpha, so it is within the limit, then with confidence, with confidence alpha, for example, named five percent, we accept the hypothesis H zero, so called the null hypothesis. that distributions are same. Then the Kalmogorov Smirnov criterion. Now your question, please. Actually, the one, <laughs> there is no question. Left. No, no, no more. OK, uh, by the way, uh, let's uh, have a look at this and see whether it makes sense. When alpha increases, alpha increases, which means that if the hypothesis is accepted, the null hypothesis is accepted, the hypothesis H0 is accepted, uh, then we accept it with more and more and more and more confidence. In order to accept it with more and more and more confidence, we should probably have lesser values of d, from which uh, I conclude that probably larger values of alpha uh, should correspond to smaller values of k. Let's see. Alpha increases. Uh, 1 minus alpha decreases and it is negative. So for example, um, when alpha is very close to, when uh, alpha is very close to one, then uh, the numerator is nearly zero, therefore log is nearly minus infinity. And therefore, so alpha, alpha tends to one minus zero, which means that k alpha, uh, k alpha tends to plus infinity. Okay, uh, which means that. Um, we need very, ah, it's that way around. We need very large values of D in order to uh, override this uh, null hypothesis uh, with the corresponding uh, confidence level. So let's uh, let's check whether we did it correctly. Uh, 
I hope so. So let's let's try to compute the statistics and apply it. And we'll see, first of all, whether we, uh, what we can do. We can check whether, first of all, one thing, whether method one and method two give us equivalent distributions. And also, I think it might be interesting to check whether uh, for either method one or method two, bits and tasks are distributed. A spe a spectra for bits and tasks are same. So in this case, within each method, we'll see whether the distributions between bits and tasks are the same. If not, then um, it would be a result on its own. So for example, distributions between bits and tasks are significantly different. This could indicate, uh, I would say, significant market pressure uh, on either, uh, I mean, uh, significant imbalance uh, of the order book uh, being skewed either into the bits and tasks. And uh, this is a very interesting result on, result on its own. So not only comparing the methods, but also comparing within each method uh, the results for uh, bid and for the bid and task. Uh, it could be a very interesting idea to to verify. I think uh, we can do much more and more statistics uh, uh, to discuss, but I think we can uh, probably stop now and I will let you go and uh, try to implement it. Please feel free to ask any questions in our Telegram channel. I will try to answer them. Uh, and we'll see what we get uh, with our, our order book specter. If no more questions. Uh, actually, I have a question about yeah. uh, how we can interpret or for what we need the average distribution. So what we, we so imagine we got some and what we should do or what we need to do to interpret them and why we need them. Uh, sorry, your question is, why do we need the spectrum in the first place? As the average spectrum for the day. Oh, well, okay. Uh, why do we need the average spectrum for the day? Uh, first of all, this will allow us uh, to, as you see, we're comparing, for example, the average specter for bits and fasts. It probably, uh, it might be a good idea to compare the specter for bits and tasks for each particular T without taking the average. But uh, it is also important to compare them uh, as averages for the whole day. Why? Because if there are significant differences for the whole day, we can say that for this whole day, there is a significant order book imbalance between bits and tasks, not just instantaneous at time t. If there is instantaneous uh, imbalance uh, at time t, uh, then it is also telling of something. This could be a feature which we subsequently feed into our machine learning, uh, machine learning algorithm. But if we have, well, if, if it is an instantaneous one, but if we have uh, an imbalance between bits and tasks, which means significantly different distribution for the whole day, then uh, this result may be of some kind of economic significance. Imagine that, for example, for the whole day, we would have, I don't know, much more concentration of orders close to the top of the book for bits rather than for asks. So something like this, for the whole day, there would be, if these are bids and these are asks, I am taking some kind of extreme example, but nevertheless, support that for bids, 
It is like this. And for asks, it is like this. So for the beads, we have a very, very strong concentration, for example, towards uh, the top of the book. What do you think if we get that? And, and obviously then the Kalmogorov Smirnov criterion will see that they are not similar. What does it mean from the economical point of view? Suppose that asks are increasing maybe toward the depth of the book. Demand is not equal to the, uh, how it is in English? You see, people are putting orders to buy and buy and buy and buy to front. Yes. Whereas orders to sell are very few in front and probably more toward the rear. Which means that people are very eager to buy and reluctant to sell. That's what the picture says. All right? Mm -hmm. Very simply. Eager to buy reluctant to sell. Which means that there is a significant buying pressure from the order book information. We can also then confirm this by examining the aggressive directions of the orders. If, uh, if people, for example, place lots of buying orders uh, towards uh, the top of the book, then probably also there are more aggressive lifts. You remember aggressive buying orders are called lifts. Aggressive lifts as well. But we are not examining aggressive orders yet. So such a significant uh, imbalance between the order book spectra has economic significance. So maybe for some days, we'll identify the situations when uh, there is significant imbalance in favor of bids, or in other days, significant, uh, significant imbalance in favor of asks. It is important from the economic point of view. And then this averaged uh, spectrum is also important uh, because of the following. We will then do, you remember this illegal well, almost, uh, orders uh, for large quantities placed without the intent to fill. You remember? At some particular T, there would be a very, very significant spike in the spectrum, which indicates, uh, probably indicates uh, a manipulative order placed without the intent to trade. Remember this? We discussed that. In order to detect such abnormalities, we would need to compare instantaneous spectra at each time t with some kind of a reference spectra, which we consider to be, I wouldn't say necessarily the correct one, but uh, the average one. And in order to do this, we still need to construct the average spectrum. So these are the reasons why we are definitely interested in average spectra. And we'll do more uh, about this uh, in the next lecture. So basically, that's all. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much for the explanation. Uh, how do you feel about this? Is it doable, difficult? It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. So then let's 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 go and get it. Thank you. If any questions, please ask in Telegram. Thank you.